speaker is uh, uh, Clay Tabor, who um, is a, a so assistant uh, professor at, in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Connecticut. Um, so a little bit of background uh, is Clay did his uh, undergraduate degree uh, in atmospheric science with a minor in mathematics from the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Uh, and then he uh, moved to the University of Michigan in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences um, and did his PhD uh, in paleoclimatology under the direction uh, of Chris Polson. Uh, and so that's actually where I, I first crossed paths a little bit with Clay because I was, he had started um, and was in his first few years as I was finishing up uh, at the University of Michigan in a different department. But actually my first undergraduate research project was with um, Chris Polson in the uh, Earth and, and Environmental Sciences Department. Um, and then we, we did cross paths a few other times because after uh, uh, the University of Michigan and his PhD, he went to the National Center for Atmospheric Research um, and worked on uh, as an advanced study program postdoc, uh, working on paleoclimate modeling, uh, which I think we're going to learn a little bit more about today. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Clay. Today his um, seminar is about using Earth system model to explore kill mechanisms associated with end of the Cretaceous mass extinction. So I'll turn it over to you. Make sure that's on. Yeah, so hopefully everybody can hear me and the people online can hear me as well. All right, got a thumbs up. All right. All right, well, yeah, so thanks, Kevin, for the introduction and the invite. Um, thank you all for having me today. Um, today I'll be talking about some things that are maybe a little bit further in the past than you all are used to dealing with, but hopefully it provides um, uh, entertaining talk. Um, it's been a lot of fun to do these simulations and provide some kind of first order responses of the Earth system. Um, and before I begin, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge my many, many collaborators on this project. So this is a large interdisciplinary project involving many different people at many different institutions um, to try and help us understand, you know, the whole Earth system response, not just the atmosphere or the ocean, but also the biology um, and some of these longer term um, proxy reconstructions. All right, so for those of you unfamiliar, um, the in Cretaceous or Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction occurred about 66 million years ago. Um, and it was the most recent of the five big mass extinctions in Earth's history. Um, and so at this time, about 75% of all species went extinct. And at this time, there was coincident with a large asteroid impact in the Gulf of Mexico region, which is thought to be the primary driver of the extinction. So the real question I'm gonna be trying to address today is how did the Earth system respond in the months to millennia after this asteroid impact event? All right, can we really get a better understanding of what from the asteroid impact led to the extinction instead of just saying we know an asteroid impact was bad for biology? So a little bit more on um, the background of the actual impact. It's known as the Chicxulub impact based on the location of the impact. And it was first proposed as a kill mechanism for the in Cretaceous before we even knew where the asteroid was. So we found an iridium layer that was pretty much global in coverage dated to around the time of the extinction. And iridium is very rare on Earth, but it's very common in asteroids. And so if you have this uniform deposition of iridium, it suggests that somewhere there's probably a large asteroid impact. And so they put this idea out there as the mechanism for the extinction, uh, but they didn't even know where the impact site was yet. And it wasn't until like a decade later in the early 90s where they actually found this impact site uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and it was um, then deduced that it was about a 12 kilometer diameter uh, impactor and produced about 180 kilometer crater as a result. And they've done a lot of work since then, like drilling the site and finding a lot of interesting things about what was unique about this site that could have helped contribute to the extinction. And here's just kind of an image, hopefully maybe you can see my mouse here, of the impact site with the paleo um, um, topography and bathymetry. So it's a shallow sea impact site um, in this Gulf region. All right. So fortunately for uh, me, there's been you know some stuff in the media that kind of hyped up asteroid impacts, and I know it's not really talking about asteroid impacts, but let's take it literally for a second, right? We have some pretty good evidence that the an large asteroid impact is not great for us. It was not great for the dinosaurs. It was not great 
for life on Earth in general. Um, this asteroid impact is thought to have led to mega tsunamis. Um, and so it was a shallow sea site, uh, but there are tsunamis that actually reached well into the continent of Ontario, the US. So there's actual bed deposits from this tsunami, uh, from these tsunamis. The impact also is thought to have led to massive earthquakes and volcanism, possibly even um, invigorating some of this large igneous province volcanism on the other side of the world. Um, associated with this impact event was a thermal pulse. And so a whole bunch of material was ejected from this impact that got well up into the upper levels of the atmosphere and then rained back down towards the surface. And in doing so, it frictionally heated the atmosphere that then potentially could have broiled the Earth's surface. So anything that was exposed, particularly in the terrestrial realm, would have had a really bad day from that. And then finally, on the longer term, looking at you know, years to decades um, to even millennia, we have emissions um, of soot, dust, um, SO2, um, halogens, water, and CO2 that could have changed climate, both leading to cooling and warming. So we have all these potential mechanisms to kill off things like the dinosaurs, as well as a lot of other things. Um, so most famously, it killed off the non-avian dinosaurs, but um, also in like the marine realm, we lost over 90% of our primary producers in places. Uh, we also lost a lot of vegetation across the boundary. And so what exactly was the kill mechanism? So we have these various ideas, right? We have this thermal pulse that could have cooked the dinosaurs, for example. Uh, but that maybe wasn't as large of an impact in the marine realm and things that were also able to shelter themselves from this thermal pulse. Um, we also could have had this impact winter, so to speak, where we had these aerosols that got up into the atmosphere, blocking light from reaching the surface, both reducing photosynthetic activity, as well as leading to widespread cooling. Um, we also could have had extreme acidification. So a lot of sulfur was in the impact rock, SO2 was emitted, um, that could have led to acid rain as well as ocean acidification. And then we could have had things like ozone destruction. So um, getting things up into the stratosphere, um, such as the water vapor, halogens, and NOx could have led to a prolonged destruction of ozone, increasing UV at the surface. And if all of that wasn't enough, even longer term, potentially CO2 being emitted from the eruption could have led to a longer term warming um, that could have been impactful as well. So unfortunately, um, we don't have the model simulations or the time to discuss all these potential kill mechanisms today. So what I wanna really talk about is two main things. And the first part of my talk will be some stuff we've done looking at the impact winter and trying to simulate that with an Earth system model. And then in part two will be some ongoing preliminary work looking at trying to simulate the marine biological response to some of these impact winter forces. So, um, it's long been thought theoretically that there should have been uh, impact winter from these emissions from the asteroid impact. Uh, however, it's very hard to find this information in the geologic record for several reasons. One, it's a relatively short-lived event. So we're talking on the order of decades here and we're looking 66 million years ago. So we really oftentimes just don't have the temporal resolution to capture some of those changes that we'd expect to have occurred. Um, furthermore, a lot of our proxies actually come from things that went extinct across the boundary. And so we can't use them anymore to actually capture that type of response. All that said, there are a few records that suggest rapid cooling after the impact in line with theory. So here's just a sea surface temperature record. And this area highlighted here is the first few years after the impact event, suggesting about seven degrees of cooling locally. There's also evidence from sedimentary deposition suggesting there was a lot of material ejected from the impact. So there's iron nanoparticles that are found around the globe. There's widespread soot deposition as shown in this um, plot here that spiked right at the boundary as well. And so all these things, as well as the patterns of extinction, support both cooling and a loss of photosynthetic activity. All right. So if we want to try and simulate this impact winter scenario, first we need to simulate the Cretaceous climate. And here's just a little bit of background on what things were like before we had this asteroid impact. And so the Cretaceous is known as a greenhouse climate, meaning we didn't have any polar ice sheets. Um, but the late Cretaceous was a little bit cooler than a lot of the Cretaceous was. So here's just a temperature reconstruction of deep ocean temperature change over the past 100 million years. 
And during the middle Cretaceous around 100 million years ago, these were some of the hottest temperatures we've had over the past 400 million years. But by the time we get to the late Cretaceous, this area of interest here, we're down to um, you know, significantly cooler temperatures. So overall, things have cooled off, but we still aren't cool enough to have polar ice sheets and our latitudinal temperature gradient was still a lot lower than it is today. So how do we go about simulating this type of chaos? And I think, you know, the majority of the time that I spend doing research and as well as with many of these collaborators is really just trying to get this model to be stable and accurately represent some of these impact emission scenarios. Um, and so we need a fully coupled climate system model um, that can capture, you know, not only the atmospheric response, but also the ocean and the terrestrial and sea ice responses. And so in this case, we're using the community earth system model. Um, and this version, for those of you who might know a little bit more about it, is uh, the CAM4 atmosphere with the POP2 ocean, uh, sea ice 4 and CLM4. And in this initial spin up state to get this pre-impact um, Cretaceous climate, we're using a low top atmosphere configuration. So what this means is we're simulating the troposphere and the first two levels of the stratosphere. And generally speaking, that's fine for most climate studies, all right? We don't need to worry about those upper, upper levels. Uh, most of the weather is really taking place in the troposphere. And so in order to spin this up, and I won't bore you with all the gory details, but what we've done is change the continental configuration uh, because the Cretaceous tectonics were significantly different than present day. And you can see that in the outline of this plot here. Um, we also had to adjust the CO2 to accurately reflect the Cretaceous climate, so we increased it to 560 ppm um, in line with the CO2 reconstructions. We adjusted the solar constant to have less total solar irradiance for this time period um, and adjusted things like the aerosol distribution um, for a Cretaceous climate. And of course, also had to modify vegetation based on the fossil records. And so we put all these boundary conditions into the model and then we run it for a long period of time because we don't know what the actual climate's supposed to be. So we start with a relatively warm guess for the ocean temperature and allow it to reach an equilibrium state. And this is our resulting equilibrium temperature at the surface here, overall warmer climate than today. And we've done some stuff, although I don't show it here, comparing with proxy reconstructions of sea surface temperature. And the model does a fairly good job at capturing this overall temperature and this reduced latitudinal temperature gradient. All right, so that's great for getting our control simulation, but in order to simulate this asteroid impact and um, the aerosols that were emitted from it, we actually need to change our configuration bit. And so what we do is we switch our atmosphere model from CAM to WACM. And WACM is basically the same general model as CAM, but it simulates us all the way up into the thermosphere. So we're getting additional levels that are important for these aerosol emissions that went way up into the upper levels of the atmosphere. And this also includes some basic chemistry, as well as this Karma aerosol model, which allows us to simulate the aerosols, the radiative properties, but it also has this fairly unique feature that allows the aerosol size distribution to evolve. Um, so the aerosols, for example, can clump together and become larger, which is really important when we have these really, really massive aerosol loadings. All right. So with this established equilibrium pre-impact Cretaceous state, um, I should mention this is called the Maastrichtian. So if you see that in some slides, that's the name of the latest Cretaceous period. Um, we then perform three different emission scenarios to look at the most likely culprits of this impact winter. All right, so one potential scenario is that the impact winter was driven by soot emissions. So we have this evidence for a lot of soot deposition right at the time of the impact, and it's thought that a large um, component of this soot emission was actually from widespread fires as a result of this thermal pulse. So the thermal pulse triggered fires around the globe. These fires emitted a whole bunch of soot that reached up into the troposphere and some into the uh, stratosphere and led to a blocking of sunlight. We also have evidence for a lot of sulfur in the impact site. So they actually drilled into the impact site, looked at the rock that was there before the impact, and found it was fairly sulfur rich carbonate rocks. And so they estimated from that that the sulfur emission uh, would be quite massive. And so we also simulate um, emissions from sulfur in the form of SO2. And finally, 
dust really representing these large um, iron nanoparticles. Um, also, we had major contributions from that. We can see that in sediment deposition around the globe. And so we do a simulation looking at the dust emissions and their contributions to an impact winter as well. So with this configuration and these three different experiments, we emit the material uh, in different ways, depending on what type of emissions we're looking at. Uh, for the dust and the SO2 emissions, we're primarily looking at ballistic emissions. And what we do here is add the material globally um, as a um, distribution around 50 kilometers in height. So way up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. In contrast for our soot emissions, since we believe they primarily come from fires, we instead emit them at the tropopause as a Gaussian distribution. And then there's a smaller contribution from splash material of uh, additional inputs of dust at the impact site itself. So a column of dust right at the impact site. And we emit all these um, over the course of a single day in this case. So really rapid emission of these different scenarios. All right. So moving on to some results. This is just showing the time since impact on the x-axis here. Um, so time zero going 10 years into the future. And then on the y-axis, I have um, height of the atmosphere in hectopascals. And plotted here is the global average uh, mass mixing ratio of these three different emissions. All right. So on the first, I have the soot emissions here. And the soot is emitted primarily at the tropopause but quickly gets lofted into the upper levels of the atmosphere. And this is because the soot is um, fairly light and fluffy, and it's a very good absorber of shortwave radiation. So it actually absorbs that shortwave and is able to heat and get self-lofted up into the upper levels of the atmosphere. And then it begins to gradually settle out de um, uh, uh, deposit gravitational settling, as well as a wet deposition feedback around year six that I don't really have time to get into here. Uh, but after 10 years or so, it's pretty much removed from the system. In the middle plot, I'm showing um, sulfuric acid produced from the SO2 emissions. And so like the uh, soot, it has a fairly long atmospheric residence time. And in this case, it's because we just emitted so much SO2 that it takes a very long time for that SO2 to convert to sulfuric acid and come out of the system. And finally, on the right over here, we have the dust emissions. And in contrast to the soot and the SO2 emissions, the dust emissions have a much shorter uh, atmospheric residence time. Um, they don't absorb the light, instead they scatter it, they tend to be denser, so they are able to rapidly coagulate and gravitationally settle out of the atmosphere. All right. So moving on to some of the climatological responses that we see from this, uh, as you might have guessed, we have a large reduction and shortwave radiation as a result of these different aerosol emissions. So here I'm showing time since impact going out 20 years after impact, and I'm showing the relative change in surface shortwave radiation. And so in black, I have the soot. In blue, I have the result of the SO2 emissions. And in red, I have the result of the dust emissions. Um, and what I just want to highlight here is that the biggest reduction in surface shortwave radiation is really coming from the soot. So soot and its radiated properties does a very good job at preventing that shortwave radiation from reaching the surface. And we have over two years of light levels, basically below 1% of normal. In contrast, the SO2 can do a fairly good job of blocking light, but as the uh, particles become larger, their efficiency at blocking the light and scattering the light becomes less, and it really never gets low enough light levels to completely prevent photosynthetic activity, but still you know, gets down to uh, upwards of 80% reduction in light levels from SO2 emissions. And finally, the dust, like soot, does a very good job at blocking the light just because we have so much dust in the system, but it falls out fairly quickly. And so it doesn't have nearly as long of a um, blocking of light compared to the other two emissions. So trying to put this a little bit more into a context of extinction mechanisms, here I'm showing the number of days with light levels below 1% of normal um, for these different scenarios. And so this 1% of normal is a rough estimate of where you can no longer have photosynthetic activity. Um, and so just showing the contrast between these three scenarios, the soot has, you know, over two years of light levels below 1% uh, um, of normal in places around the globe. Um, so this would be a major devastating effect to primary producers. In contrast, the SO2 emissions um, have nowhere that 
reduces light level below 1% of normal. So photosynthetic activity would be reduced for sure, but it would never be completely stopped from the SO2 emission scenario. And dust, again, has a small contribution of no light, but it's um, a relatively short duration of it of only um, you know, uh, several weeks. So as you might expect, the reduction in light leads to a significant change in temperature. And here's showing the temperature anomalies for our three different experiments. Uh, again, because of the reduction in light levels, the soot leads to the greatest amount of cooling. All right, and so by year three, we've cooled the globe by 17 degrees Celsius. All right, major reduction in temperature. Um, but the SO2 response is not far behind. Um, and there's some actually some interesting interactions with how much long wave radiation can escape the system that allows the SO2 emission to be more comparable in terms of cooling to the dust, or sorry, to the soot, even with less shortwave blocking. And then the dust, you know, it looks like a relatively small cooling in comparison to the soot and the SO2 emissions, uh, but six degrees of cooling in a, a few years would, would not be great for life on Earth regardless. So it's relatively small, but still catastrophic. All right. Spatially, the cooling um, is fairly similar for all the different emission scenarios. So here in the top left, I have the pre-impact controlled climate, you know, this low latitudinal temperature gradient, overall warm climate conditions. And then I have the year of greatest cooling, greatest anomaly from the control simulation. And in all cases, um, I'll just focus on the soot example here. The cooling is greatest over the land and in these shallow sea locations where originally we had open ocean, uh, but then the sea ice was able to rapidly advance and you got additional cooling in that case. And we also see the smallest amount of cooling in the higher latitude open ocean. Um, and I'll talk about why that seems to be the case in a few slides. So again, if we try to connect this a little bit to um, extinction, um, uh, of life on Earth. Um, here I'm showing the uh, number of increase in freezing days in these different emission scenarios and the maximum cooling of the upper 100 meters of the ocean water. All right, so, you know, for ex experience, if I planted tomatoes last year in April because I was impatient and then it got below freezing, my tomatoes all died. The same kind of idea here is if we get below freezing temperatures down to tropical uh, locations, a lot of that life would not be prepared for such cooling. And so here, the pattern really looks the similar, uh, quite similar between the dust, um, soot, and SO2 cases, but only in the soot case do we have freezing temperatures reaching into the very low tropics. So there's very few places of refugia for potential vegetation that can't withstand some freezing temperatures. And in the temperature response of the ocean, we see the greatest cooling in the low latitudes. Uh, because we just don't have that surface shortwave heating that we initially had, and so it rapidly is able to cool off in the low latitudes. And furthermore, we actually have an increase in deep water formation in the high latitudes that's actually pulling a lot of that heat from the low latitudes to the high latitude regions. Here. Right. So with this reduction in light, not only are we cooling this, the system, but we're removing a lot of the energy and these gradients, both in the vertical and in the horizontal. And as a result, our circulation pretty much goes to, to nothing. Um, our Hadley circulation, our Walker circulation, all these features that we know about for uh, studying climate more or less disappear for a period of time. And not only does that affect the circulation, but it also affects our overall precipitation. So convective precipitation almost completely ceases to exist while light levels are low. And again, you can see that the biggest signal is with this soot due to the greatest reduction in surface shortwave radiation um, and a rapid kind of recovery here, again, with this wet deposition response that I don't really have time to go into. All right. So spatially, again, you know, the pre-impact climate, fairly similar to present day, right? We changed a lot of things to be able to get at these regional differences that could be important. But at first order, these large scale features still exist. We still have the intertropical convergence zone. We still have Hadley circulation. Uh, we still have a Walker circulation. Um, you know, there's small scale differences, but really it's a, a, you know, an earth climate state here. When we reduce the light, and here I'm showing these precipitation anomalies for these three different scenarios. Again, just like with the temperature, the maximum difference 
what we see is a general similar pattern of response. The intertropical convergence zone shows the greatest reduction in precipitation. And basically, once you get light levels below about 70% of normal, it just stopped happening more or less. Um, but somewhat interestingly is these areas that are very arid and dry in our pre-impact climate state actually become a little bit more moist after the reduction in light. And this seems to be related to the fact that we have almost like a uniform kind of drizzle around the planet. And we no longer have these dry subsidence zones. And so these areas actually get a little bit more moisture, a little bit more precipitation in the years after impact, despite this overall global reduction. All right. So again, maybe trying to tie a little bit more to life. And um, I just found it interesting. Um, here we're looking at the winds at the surface and our precipitation minus evaporation. Um, and so everywhere that we are having a precipitation dominated environment becomes significantly drier after the impact. So you might think that these low latitude tropical regions um, that are dependent on the um, moist uh, convection going on to uh, keep the jungles um, alive would be very devastated by this. But in contrast, some of the places that are generally very, very uh, dry due to uh, evaporation dominated environment actually become more moist in a relative sense because the evaporation goes to very low levels due to low light and cooler temperatures. Um, and so with all these different scenarios, it doesn't really matter. You get the very similar um, response um, with the uh, maximum changes in precipitation minus evaporation. All right. And so finally, I'm just throwing this in here for a quick slide because uh, we'll be talking about it more in part two of the presentation. Uh, but here I'm showing the changes in the ocean circulation as a result of these different emission scenarios. And so in the top left, I have the control simulation and looking at the um, mixing um, depth of the ocean as a proxy for where we're getting deep water formation. And hopefully what you can see here is that most of the deep water is really occurring in the high southern latitudes of the Pacific. All right, and overall the circulation is fairly sluggish and that generally agrees with some different proxy reconstructions. Um, but once we um, turn off the lights in these scenarios and, and get a large increase in, um, uh, or a large decrease in temperature and a increase in um, ocean salinity due to a reduction in precipitation, we get a massive increase in mixing almost everywhere in the ocean, particularly in the high latitude regions. And so the, this massive increase in mixing in these scenarios actually leads to a significant increase in poleward heat transport in the ocean and leads to a removal of heat from the equatorial region, moving that heat to the poles, which moderates the cooling in the poles and helps amplify the cooling in the low latitudes. All right, so just to kind of quickly summarize what's going on in part one. What we find is that all of these different emission scenarios could be devastating, but we think they all occurred simultaneously. And if we had to choose which one was most devastating for life on Earth and best matches with the um, biological reconstructions, we think soot was probably the primary driver of the extinction, particularly for photosynthesizers in the marine realm, because only soot is able to reduce light levels low enough to pretty much stop photosynthetic activity for a prolonged period of time. Um, not only does soot reduce the photosynthetic activity the most, it also leads to the greatest cooling and the greatest reduction in precipitation. And so it's probably the um, primary driver of this ocean extinction. Um, that said, when we're trying to think about how could anything have survived this devastation, right? This isn't even everything that could have impacted life on Earth. Um, we're trying to find potential refugia. And we think that maybe some of these higher latitude regions where the cooling wasn't as great um, would have been more likely for life, not only because there's less cooling, but also the species living up there are already used to a large seasonal cycle. Um, and in fact, you had, you know, vegetation surviving in Antarctica through, um, you know, several months of darkness at this time period. So they were able to handle some of these kind of extreme climate seasonality already. Maybe that made them a little bit more adapted for this uh, impact winter event. All right. So, uh, with part two, what we want to do is actually try to simulate these things better. So um, move away from speculating on what the biological response would be and actually looking to see if we can simulate some of these biological responses um, to better compare them with the sediment core records. Because some of the best paleoclimate records we have 
are really coming from the sediment cores that have been drilled around the globe. And these sediment cores tell us some fairly interesting things. Uh, for one, just looking at diversity and fossil numbers, we can see that these uh, primary producers, particularly the planktonic foraminifera and the calcareous nanofossils, uh, lost about 90% of their diversity across the boundary. So they were devastated by this event. All right. And not only that, we see some interesting signals in the Delta 13C record. So that's just shown here in this red dots. Here's the impact event in orange. Before the impact, we had fairly enriched uh, Delta 13C in the surface ocean. And this is suggesting that we had a lot of primary productivity in the surface ocean. And then those species were dying and falling to the deep ocean. All right, so I don't need to get into details of um, exactly the mechanisms. Uh, but what's going on here is that after the impact event, there's this dramatic drop in the Delta 13 C of the surface ocean, suggesting a significant reduction in primary productivity, possibly, or some other change in the biological pump. And this change persisted for millions of years. Um, and so there's a lot of question about what exactly that means. Does that mean that the oceans were more or less um, uh, free of uh, biological productivity for thousands to millions of years, or did some change in the biological pump occur to show that response? Um, originally, this was called the strange love ocean because they thought that it was like a major wipeout of everything for, for many millennia. But um, since then, we've revised some of those ideas. And as well, we also have some evidence of ocean acidification at this time. So we can actually begin to simulate some of these things. Do we see an ocean acidification signal, for example, when we apply these forces? All right, so again, the model we're gonna be using here is the community earth system model. And you know that can mean a million things. So if you see a paper that says, we use the community earth system model, go look into the methods for what they actually did. Uh, I'll provide a bit more information here. This is technically the community earth system model version two code base, but what we're really just using here is the ocean model. So we're using the pop two ocean model. Um, and in the latest version of CESM, they have a ocean biogeochemistry component known as marble. And the nice thing about marble is not only can we simulate um, these planktonic um, functional types, we can also simulate changes in the Delta 13 C. So as I mentioned, we're doing ocean only simulations here. Um, so ultimately our goal is to use the Cretaceous boundary conditions and have a fully spun up um, configuration for the Cretaceous. Uh, but for our first preliminary testing, what we're really looking at is just to see how the present day climate would respond to these uh, different impact winter forcing scenarios. And so what we're using here is year 2000 boundary conditions. So present day geography, land cover with a spun up year 2000 biogeochemistry in the ocean. And we're providing impacts based on these fully coupled simulations that we did previously, where we know how much light reduction there was, how much change of precipitation there was, et cetera, that we can put into these ocean only simulations. And the nice thing about this framework is it allows us to tease apart the different signals going on because we can force the ocean model with just the temperature response, for example, or just the precipitation response instead of having them all together. So we can begin to understand what's really going on, what's really the primary driver of the extinction in the Vermin realm. And for this, we run each of these simulations for uh, 35 years at low resolution. All right. So we mentioned that there's you know, all these different forcings that could be leading to this extinction. Um, and so I've broken them down here into the temperature change, the precipitation change, the change in the winds, the change in light and um, CO2 and dust. And so we're able to force this ocean model with each one of these changes independently. And at the end, I'll look at them all together. So first we're gonna look at the change in temperature. So we decrease temperature uh, linearly over a three year period to reach ocean surface temperatures of about 10 degrees of cooling, which is in line with our impact winter scenario. And then linearly increase the temperature back to the pre-impact climate state. And let me just set up um, some of these figures here. Um, so the next few slides will all have this format. And the top left here, I have the maximum annual decrease in net primary productivity. So this is the year of greatest decrease in primary productivity due to the forcing that's uh, being in, in, uh, applied. 
And in the bottom plot, I have the maximum annual increase in net prior order productivity due to the forcing that's being applied. And then on the bottom right over here, I have since the time of the impact out 35 years into the future on the x-axis versus global average um, carbon from net primary productivity. The black line is the pre-impact pre control and the red is the anomaly due to, or not the anomaly, sorry, the change um, in the um, simulation with the uh, prescribed forcing. So again, here I'm looking at the temperature response um, and just a few things to point out is that overall, this cooling leads to a reduction in net primary productivity in our simulations. But it's not a uniform reduction in net primary productivity. What we seem to get is a um, shift in where our productivity is occurring. In particular, these high latitude um, um, PFTs, so to speak, are uh, able to move equatorward as it gets colder. So it gets too cold at the very high latitudes for these diatoms and copolithophores. They are able to migrate equatorward where they're happy again. And they actually increase productivity in those lower latitude regions, while in the higher latitudes, productivity generally decreases. And um, this response um, shows the complexity of the spatial pattern, um, but only persists until temperatures really are able to return to normal for the most part. There's still some uh, moderate differences, even getting out 35 years into the future. All right. So we can do the same thing with precipitation. Right. We looked at the precipitation before and saw that there was about six years of precipitation decreased by about 75%. So we put that into the model, decrease our precipitation by 75%, decrease our runoff as well, um, and look at the response to that. And again, the same plotting format set up here. But with this plot, I'd like to draw your attention to this bottom panel here, where we actually see around year seven, a significant increase in productivity in the high latitude regions. Um, that's a kind of interesting result. And what seems to be going on here is an actual increase in um, ventilation and mixing in the high latitudes with this reduction in precip. Um, and so the high latitudes, um, we didn't change evaporation. They're able to become saltier. You get more mixing in the high latitudes that allows the diatoms to be happy because there's more nutrients available for them. Um, while there's not much change in the low latitude regions. And you can see that kind of spike here. Um, again, fairly moderate increase in productivity um, that generally decreases as soon as the precipitation returns to normal. All right. So the wind forcing, again, is fairly in line with the precipitation forcing. So while the precipitation was low, the winds were also fairly low. It's not until the light really comes back, we get these pressure gradients redeveloping, we get the wind strength coming back. So we can reduce the light, or, or sorry, reduce the winds. Um, by about 75% for six years as well. Um, and this response um, was fairly interesting and, and complex to me. And, and we still have more uh, work to do to really tease apart what's going on here. But one thing that we didn't really um, anticipate initially is when we reduce the winds, we actually heat up the surface ocean quite a bit. Um, and so the ocean becomes somewhat more stratified. We're not mixing the surface air and the surface winds together. And the very surface ocean actually raises by several degrees. Um, and that makes the high latitude diatoms um, somewhat unhappy. Um, and so they die off to an extent. And we also have some changes in where we have upwelling. So you can kind of see this reduction in productivity where we initially have the cold tongue that doesn't really exist anymore, less nutrients available, some reduction in productivity there as well. So overall, what we get is a reduction in productivity associated with these low winds um, for various reasons, including both temperature and nutrient availability. But it's really only impacting the surface ocean, the upper 100 meters or so. And so once the winds are able to recover, um, there's still some nutrients at depth and things get back to normal fairly rapidly. All right. So as you might expect, probably one of the biggest and most devastating changes is the light response. Um, and so here we're reducing light levels by 75% or sorry, 100% for three years and then doing a step increase for 25% of normal, then 50%, then 75%, then back to normal. And in this case, we're only looking at the light contribution. And so the nice thing about these experiments is we don't have to tie the change in light to the change in temperature. We can still provide the same temperature input while just looking at how the light affects the response. And so here, really what we're seeing as we kind of would expect is we get basically a complete loss of productivity 
for three years while light levels are completely down to zero. However, we get a fairly interesting response when we look at the global average through time. What we see is that even when light levels only at 25% of normal around the SO2 emission scenario, the diatoms are able to survive in our situation. Um, and they actually have, they're actually able to thrive. And we think that's in part due to two reasons. While productivity is down to zero, we're accumulating a bunch of nutrients that aren't being used by the biology because there's very little activity going on. So once light begins to return and the diatoms are able to come back, they have a lot of nutrients available in order to thrive. And not only do we have this um, change in the uh, nutrient availability, uh, but the diatoms seem to respond much more quickly and don't really have as much competition going on um, right when this light comes back. So they actually have this uh, rapid spike in productivity um, and then kind of die back down after they use up those nutrients. And then everything begins to have a more gradual recovery with a small spike as well once light fully recovers and then not too long getting back to normal. All right. So with the CO2 response, we didn't include those before in our um, impact winter forcing scenarios, uh, because on the short term, realistically, it's probably not a major driver in the physical climate, all right? You don't have much of a greenhouse effect when you have no shortwave radiation coming into your system. So we thought it was secondary and we didn't worry about it. But that being said, there are some proxy reconstructions that suggest CO2 would have increased maybe by 300 or so parts per million due to a combination of fires from the impact as well as vaporized carbonate from the impact rock. And so here, when we're trying to look at the biological response, we do want to look at the CO2 contribution. And in this case, again, we're not including the radiative effects of the CO2, we're just including um, the CO2 itself as it can interact with the ocean biogeochemistry. And what we see is that overall, the response is very, very small from the CO2, uh, somewhat surprisingly. Um, so you do get a decrease in pH, you do get thinner shells of your species, um, that have calcium-based shells, but we don't have a major increase or decrease in primary productivity. And in fact, the coccolithophores seem to have a small increase in productivity, uh, possibly as a result of um, alleviation of some carbon limitation they have um, in the high latitude regions. There's also this weird signal off the Gulf of, or off the coast of Africa that I don't entirely understand, but if you can see that scale bar down here, and I apologize for the size, the overall signal is quite small. So these changes are relatively minimal compared to what we see from some of these other forcing scenarios. All right. So finally, you know, looking back at that dust emission scenario, we saw that we emitted 2 million teragrams of dust over the course of a day. And within a year, it was 95 plus percent out of the atmosphere. And so that dust um, has to go somewhere and it gets deposited globally around the earth. And a lot of it goes into the ocean. And we know that in present day climate, a lot of the ocean is iron limited. And so this dust getting into the ocean, as we might expect, can really change our productivity. And so we include that forcing here by upping our dust deposition um, to very high levels for a four month period of time. And what we see here is what we expect, um, particularly um, where we have iron limitation and in these high Southern latitudes, the diatoms um, have a massive increase in productivity um, and they're not the only ones, uh, many other species do as well. Um, and this signal persists for um, upwards of 15 years or so as they use up those nutrients and as the nutrients settle out of the ocean um, before recovering back to normal. So as we've seen from these different emission, or these different forcing scenarios, not everything acts in the same way. Some of these things lead to a reduction in primary productivity, whereas others lead to a significant increase in primary productivity. And so what happens when we combine all these things together, which ones are really the most important? So this is a full forcing scenario. And you know we see hints of all these different forcings coming up in the combined forcing scenario. But the two major things that really stand out are the reduction in light and the increase in nutrients. And so what we get is a period of light level, or, um, zero photosynthetic activity going on. Our primary productivity goes to zero as well. And then once light's able to recover, even partially, especially for the diatoms, with this additional dust deposition, we get this massive increase in productivity um, as, and, and with several spikes above the background levels that persists 15 years or so into the future. All right, so 
When I showed earlier, we had the sediment core and looked at these long-term changes. You know, we had million year plus changes in the Delta 13 C record. Um, and when we look at our simulations, what we see is, you know, these major perturbations, but things are able to respond fairly quickly. And that's partly a product of how the model is configured. We don't have true extinction in the model. Uh, but what it can tell us is that, you know, the physical and the chemical environment um, we're not potentially limiting um, this productivity, or at least not the first order driver. It seems like maybe some uh, extinctions and evolutionary um, aspects are in coming into play when we actually look at the proxy records. But we do have some evidence to suggest that there were some significant changes in the ocean physical and chemical um, systems that would have had a prolonged response. And so here I'm just showing a few examples of this from the full forcing scenario where I have the upper kilometer of the ocean on the y-axis and time since impact. In this case, it starts at um, year 150, going out 35 years into the future. And so a few things just to point out is, one, we get a significant increase in ocean stratification after the impact. So we get a lot of cooling at the surface, and we get this really massive increase in deep water formation that pulls this cold water to death. And you can see this cold water um, sinking and then expanding outwards in the years after the impact. So once the light returns, the surface ocean is able to warm back up fairly rapidly, uh, but the subsurface stays cold. And so that increases our ocean stratification. And we also see a similar amplification of that response with the salinity changes. So initially, our salinity is plotted here. Oh, I should, I should mention these are anomaly plots. So this is the cooling here. Um, and then our salinity change on the right over here as well shows a significant um, decrease in surface ocean salinity as the stratification from the temperature builds. And in the subsurface, we actually get an increase in salinity as that initial um, um, more um, high saline water with low precipitation is able to sink to death. So both these things could potentially lead to longer term consequences, less um, mixing, increased stratification that could have a longer term uh, consequences for biological activity. And then on the bottom plots, I have the anomaly in pH and delta 13 C. And so the pH response is quite interesting. We increase the CO2 right away from these impact scenarios, but really we don't get much of a pH response until the winds are able to recover. So we don't have much communication between the surface ocean and the atmosphere. And so that CO2 signal isn't getting into the atmosphere until we get the winds recover in around year six. But once we do, we get this anticipated decrease in ocean pH as a result of our CO2 increase. And finally, looking at the Delta 13 C response, we do see changes that um, reflect the Delta 13 C decrease in the proxy records, uh, but the magnitude is a little bit less and there's a lot of very, very high temporal resolution variations that we wouldn't expect to capture in the actual pro uh, proxy records. So what we see is initially a depletion in the surface ocean Delta 13 C due to the reduction in productivity, that spike in productivity actually leads to a positive anomaly in the Delta 13 C, and then a long-term gradual decrease, uh, possibly due to changes in pH and other um, factors limiting overall productivity in the ocean. All right. So uh, just to quickly summarize, the ocean response is complex, and we still have a lot of work to do to really tease apart these signals, understand what's going on, and also get them into a proper Cretaceous simulation. Uh, but what we do find is that the most important seem to be the light reduction, as has been largely suspected um, from various different um, uh, fossil records. And this increase um, in productivity after the return of light due to the increase in nutrients that exist in the upper ocean. All right, but it doesn't seem like there's necessarily a single kill mechanism, so to speak. All right, so as I mentioned, what we wanna do going forward from this, we wanna couple all these things with Cretaceous boundary conditions so we can compare directly with the proxies and understand, you know, was there a difference in the carbon reservoirs in the Cretaceous um, from present day? Would that make a difference? How does having this uh, warmer base state really affect the response we see? Um, those type of questions. We really need these Cretaceous boundary conditions to do properly. And we want to fully couple it with this Wacom configuration. So no more just prescribing these different um, scenarios. We want to be able to actively, interactively simulate those changes. And you know, this, as I mentioned, is part of a much larger collaborative group. Um, so I want to acknowledge my collaborators and also mention that not only are we doing this modeling work, but we're also collecting records to um, get at high temporal variations in temperature after the impact. 
collecting more soot records to better constrain just how much soot was emitted from this impact event, as well as looking at lipid biomarkers to understand, you know, does the isotopic change actually reflect the productivity change or are there some other things going on? Um, and so these are the PIs on this work and also uh, many of the team members, graduate students, postdocs, and research faculty helping us out along the way. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions, assuming there's some time. Thanks. So we have um, maybe some time to take a question first from the, the room. And then if you want to ask a question on Zoom, if you could raise your hand, that way we know who is up. Uh, Christopher? So with the, the reduction in, you reduce the precipitation, but not the evaporation, and which, so you don't conserve water. It might not make a difference over the short run. But what, what was the rationale for reducing the precipitation, but not the evaporation? Yeah, um, it's just trickier to do <laughs> is the main part. So the ocean model will be evaporating uh, due to various different processes, but the precipitation is just coming from the atmosphere model uh, or the atmosphere forcing in this case. So we could try to go into the ocean model to modify some of those things to reduce the evaporation, um, but that's all consistent within the POP2 framework, um, which makes it a little bit difficult. So, okay, so yeah. I'll have a to switch that says conserve water. Um, yeah, so in the fully coupled simulations, okay. it is all conserved, but in the ocean only simulations, it's not. Um, and so that's a little bit of distinction there. And that, I mean, that one only really comes into play where we just um, reduced the uh, precipitation. When we do the full forcing scenario, you know, we're cooling temperatures as well, and that will reduce our evaporation, reducing light levels. So that will change our evaporation in the ocean model. Um, but it's a little bit hard to just tease apart with just. Um, Precipitation. It's a good question. It's not necessarily a fair, complete separation. Uh, that's good point. Uh, so maybe next we'll go to Zoom. Uh, I think uh, Ming Wa. Yes. Yes. So I'm just curious about the magnitude of the cooling you simulated. Uh, is that consistent with what's uh, reconstructed from observation, paleo record, the magnitude? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as I mentioned, there's very few records available and there's some debate about how accurate those records are. Uh, but if we take them at face value as those records being truth, um, our soot scenario does a fairly good job if we assume that this is the upper 100 meters or so of cooling in the Gulf region. So that's where that record came from. Uh, but I'd say that overall, I think uh, our, that record, which is the only one that really has a good quantitative estimate saying seven degrees C of cooling in the Gulf, we're probably looking at upwards of 10 degrees of cooling. So potentially a little bit greater cooling. But if that record is averaging over several years, possibly we're in fairly good agreement. Um, it's hard to get at, um, and we're trying to get more records of some of this stuff, but you know, capturing something that's on the order of weeks to months um, 66 million years ago is really a challenge. So um, we're trying to constrain things with that data, but um, we'd love to have more. And it seems like they're you know, finding new sites all the time that are giving us more high temporal stuff. So fingers crossed, we can better constrain that. Good work. Thank you. Uh, Levi? Uh, thanks for giving the talk, it's interesting. Um, I'm curious about the, the temperature cooling connected to the precipitation, and then also how that's connected to the, the atmosphere cooling the space. Did you look at, uh, it also seems like if, you, if, you, if the atmosphere cools really fast, I'm curious how much condensation there was happening in the atmosphere and what the sort of long-term humidity of the atmosphere was. Do you know if all the water just precipitated out or how the how was the long wave cooling the space connected to the precipitation change? Yeah, that's a great question. We have looked at that um, somewhat and, um, what seems to be happening is these uh, aerosol emissions actually help trap a lot of the long wave loss into space, particularly the soot scenario. Um, and so, I don't know if I have this or not, but in the soot, yeah, so this is some of the long wave responses that we get. I don't know if you can really see it well. So this is zonal um, aver or averages, um, uh, so we have, you know, latitude on the 
y-axis here and time since impact on the x-axis. Um, and you don't get um, that much. This is the long wave down at the surface. And so it basically, it's not a great plot. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily playing short, but you get a lot of this long wave actually trapped in the system from these aerosol emissions. And, uh, and surprisingly, even though you shut down light, um, in your Arctic region during um, Arctic night, it's actually warmer than it was before the impact because this long wave isn't able to escape like it is in present day climate. And what you get, particularly with the soot emission scenario is you actually begin to heat your upper atmosphere and you remove the cold trap in the stratosphere. Um, and so water vapor is actually able to get into the upper levels of atmosphere and it actually produces a kind of uh, a fairly humid environment. So not only do you have this long wave trapping from the soot itself, but an increase in water vapor through the atmospheric column. Eventually, and I don't know if I have this one either, but let's see, maybe you get this uh, interesting response. Uh, here's one that kind of shows it, where you basically saturate your atmospheric column with water vapor, and that condenses and is able to actually remove a lot of the soot relatively rapidly. So. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. How does it change so fast? So you're saturated with water vapor, then it all, what happens that you think it just all rains out? It's yeah, so cold. yeah, yeah, uh, it, that's what seems to be going on. So you get a lot of um, the soot comes in here. So this is the soot concentration. And then this is the atmospheric temperature. So you get a lot of heating from the soot absorbing that shortwave radiation. And that temperature actually erodes this cold trap in the stratosphere, which allows this water vapor shown here to increase, the levels are still fairly low, but it allows it to increase. And as the soot gradually is settling out due to gravitational processes, that temperature begins to cool again. And so you have this water vapor here, but things are cooling off. And eventually you reach um, saturation due to cooling. You hit this relative humidity threshold that happens over the globe within a period of several months that cools, condenses onto the remaining soot and actually is able to deposit it out of the system through wet deposition. Um, so it's a really crazy feedback we weren't really expecting. And it actually has an inverse relationship with the amount of soot you put in. So if you put in more soot, that feedback occurs more quickly and you actually get potentially less overall cooling than if you got less soot. So um, that was kind of an interesting response to just the importance of complex models. Is it completely right? I don't know, um, but it, it's, it's fun to think about. So I think uh, we have another question on Zoom, uh, Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Clay, for a fascinating talk. Would you care to speculate if this asteroid impact happened next week? Is there any chance of human survival anywhere? I mean, if you lived in subtropical regions and you had 10 years of canned food, could you survive? <laughs> That's a good question. So I think, yeah, if you had 10 years of canned food, you'd probably be good to go. It, the tropics don't get that cold. I mean, the Cretaceous climate's warmer, but in the tropics only several degrees warmer. So, you know, you'd still probably only get a, you know, a few days of really sub-freezing temperatures there. Um, the lack of light, you know, you probably want one of those um, grow lights or something, or one of those uh, mood helping lights to keep you going through it. Um, some stuff we're working on that might be a longer term problem is uh, actual destruction of the ozone. And the halogens that were emitted from this shallow sea impact site uh, potentially could have led to a reduction in ozone for upwards of several decades. So we're trying to tease this out and get the right chemistry in the model. But if that's the case, even when the light returns and things warm back up, you might not want to be going out in the daytime for several decades afterwards. Um, so a lot of things to consider there, but potentially at least a few people would probably make it through. Thank you. All right, well, I think with, with that question, uh, we'll finish up. So I'd like to thank Clay one more time. Thank you.